here is speeding the bar out. It uses the dowel pin on the spindle uh, to guide the bar as it's being pushed out by the IM to bar feeder. It's grabbing a turning tool, coming in, facing off the part with constant service speed, turning the OD, quarter inch end mill. Good morning, folks. What you just saw was our uh, Willeman Macadel 408 MT, or as we so often call it, our Willie. Uh, we bought this machine uh, just under a year ago, and honestly, I've been meaning to film a video about it, but number one, we really spent a good amount of time getting to know the machine, which makes me feel like I can better tell you about it, but, um, but also, it's just been running, and um, it really is uh, the coolest machine that we have that we've used and i absolutely love it i want to tell you more about you know what it is why we got it how we got it why it's the coolest machine out there and what our kind of future plans are for it start with the basics it is a machine that can mill and turn what i like about this machine is it's primarily a mill and the reason that was important to us is that we have had a lot of success over the years machining a lot of parts with that machine right there a haas st20y dual spindle y-axis driven tool laid and i actually really do like that machine the things i don't like about it are common to pretty much all of the uh lays in that platform regardless of the brand or design it which is that the turret is uh the, the driven tools on the turret are gear driven slow rpm three four five six thousand rpm and you have a very limited number of tool spots your turret can have 12 spots you can definitely get more out of it with half index and so forth, but it's totally different than this because this is a proper milling spindle. Uh, ours is a 30,000 RPM spindle. A new version of this machine is 42,000 RPM, but it's a real milling spindle. And you have in the cutest ATC ever, you have 42 different tools. Um, a number of them can be turning tools and the rest can be milling tools. And for us, this is great because we do turn on our lathe, but the most value we add to our parts and the most time that we spend is not turning, it's milling. And having the ability to have additional tools, redundant tools, higher RPMs, better accuracy, better process control on this machine. And frankly, oddly enough, it's easier to program this machine, period. And I think it's also easier to program it in a way of understanding where you have safety risks, crash risks, and so forth. There's definitely some quirks to it, which I'll come to here in a minute. but it's overall just a resounding win that represents everything I love about manufacturing. I want to zoom in there and really show. We've got a saw right now. We're using a saw to make this part here. This is our Gen 3 plug jack that functions, this is the base of it rather. So this replaces our Gen 2 plug jack and this has a locking collar on it. So your jack uh, is right here. You would screw this up and down inside of this and then it, this sort of functions like an ER that you would screw down to lock that in place to serve as a riser or support for material or an end stop. We're using the saw to cut those slots that you see in it, but we're not using the saw like some folks do to part off the material. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second to show how we do that. Let's sit here and admire this machine though. It is just the coolest machine. Thread mill. So it's kind of draw back to the comparison to our SC20Y. Uh, another option would be a traditional uh, mill turn machine. They, lots of folks make them. Akuma has the Malta series. Mazak has the, uh, not Variac, the uh, Integrex machines. There's a number of different uh, folks that make mill turns. They are B-axis machines that have a B-head with a tool changer that can turn and mill. So totally, uh, achieves a lot of the things I said before, which is the ability to both turn and mill, a proper milling spindle, five axis, etc. But the big difference, uh, in my opinion, are two things. Number one, this machine doesn't have a traditional sub spindle that you so often see on the, uh, what are often larger mill turns. This instead has a vise that's going to pop up here in a second and grab our part and switch it down, which is just phenomenal for how you think about the crash risk, the programming, uh, work holding, etc. The other major difference is this is a relatively fast machine. Now, is it blazing fast? Uh, no, the newer ones are faster, but 
some of the larger mill turn machines have five, six, eight second uh, tool change times. So for us, when we're doing a relatively high quantity of parts where for every part you have to do all of your tool changes, that is a drawback to this design. So if we have uh, 20 tools on a single part, you got to do 20 tool changes for every one that you make. Uh, you want relatively fast tool changes. Um, that is a big drawback again compared to a part, like let's say if we could make these one of these parts on a, uh, a mill or a horizontal tombstone, you might be able to put a strip of 60 parts on there and make 60 parts with 20 tool changes total versus 1,200 tool changes on a machine like this. Speaking of tool changes, uh, that is probably the first kind of red flag to, to rewind back and talk a little about uh, how we came to own this machine. Uh, we had heard about them, but seen them. Uh, good friend CJ Abraham over on Instagram uh, has now two of them. And, and I kind of understood how cool they were and what they could do, uh, but I couldn't afford one. So I started thinking about getting a used one um, and a pure coincidence around the time that we were getting serious, John Grimso actually found a used one and he bought his before us. Uh, but shortly thereafter, again, sheer coincidence, uh, we had seen that Willem and Macadell US, the actual corporation, had taken this exact machine in, as well as a sister machine on trade for a customer uh, who bought uh, a few new ones. And like so many of the customers, I believe that user is in the medical world. And, and frankly, more of these machines, given that they're given their cost and accuracy and capability, are seen on the really high end world, like making you know titanium bone type of stuff. We're using it for some pretty simple parts, but for reasons I still love. And so when this machine became sort of available, I just reached out to them and fast forward, we were able to reach a deal where they were able to go through the machine uh, and do some good uh, TLC, if you will. So none of the major components were replaced. You know, it's still a original spindle and original B-axis, so forth. But the uh, all the hoses, the lines, the fittings, the filters, you know, we had them go through it and that meant a lot to me. And they also gave us a short warranty on it. Um, but I just thought, hey, for us to succeed with this machine, it means a lot knowing that the factories had the chance to go through it and come here and actually help us install it and give a little bit of training on it. Um, but the reason I mentioned the tool changes is that uh, this machine, when we got it, I believe had over 2 million tool changes already done on it. So this was not a new machine. Uh, it's a 2004, again, it, it was used, you can see a single point threading here, really cool. Uh, but they're meant to be run and they like to be run. Nevertheless, for the folks that have followed our story, uh, you know, this is not my MO. We have generally tried to justify buying relatively new machines that come with support, warranties, quality, et cetera, to help us do what we do. But I couldn't afford a new one. And I thought, hey, I, could, I think I can make this work uh, given uh, the relationship we had or, or support we had from them, and it has. That's kind of one of the other reasons I'm happy to be filming this video uh, nine months into owning and operating the machine is it has been great. We've had very little issues with it. Uh, we did have, the closest thing we ended up having is a a very minor issue where the uh, U-axis was uh, losing about a one ten thousandth of an inch. And fast forward, long story short, we ended up spending a couple grand and replacing a servo drive and that totally fixed it. I'll be honest, I wasn't super excited about that, but most of my uh, most of my frustration around that scenario was not being sure if that was going to be the fix. Since we did it and it was the fix, it's kind of a, hey, great, she's back to running. Getting, here we go, here we go, the voice comes up, there we go. That's exactly what I was hoping to show you guys. That's one of the things I love about this machine. It flipped the vise up, it opened the jaws, grabbed the part, it twisted it off. So we're not using a saw to finish it off. We're parting it down to a small diameter and then just rotating and, and snapping the part off that way. I'll come back here and explain our offsets, but just watching again, oh, it's so cool. It'll eventually drop that part down the tube and we'll see it in the parts bin in a second over to the right. There we go. Oop, drop. And it will be right inside that bin. 
There she is. What we had been doing was setting them on these 3D printed drip trays that have some slots that allow the cutting oil to drain back into the machine. Uh, and that's a big difference on many of these style of machines as we're not using cutting fluid, uh, the quality chem that we use on all of our other machines. This actually runs cutting oil. Um, it is better in the, in the sense that it's a better lubricant. It's a better uh, conductor of heat, I believe. Um, it's just like a you get better tool light, better finishes. The drawback is um, it is expensive, and the drawback is that it tends to be, remain sticky on the parts, if you will. Um, we have since upgraded. We don't use these drip trays as much because we reached out to the folks that missed the way who make a lot of our mist units and asked them if they could build us a blow-off box, and this thing has been great. So we put a foot pedal on it so you can turn it on. It pulls up pressure, and we can now use a hose, blow off the parts through these filter, keep our shop air quality up there, a nice and clean, and works absolutely great. Hey, Grant, should it be running? Grant has been an absolute boss on getting this machine uh, just absolutely rocking to make all these parts. What was it, an option stop or some sign or part uh, counter? Parts count. Part counter, okay. So now it'll come back in, get rid of the tool, I believe. Oh no, first thing it does is part it off, right? All about, that's the first thing it ever does and that has to do with making sure you don't ever try to push the bar into the spindle that you're about to see here with a part that didn't actually get removed. Because the way to run these machines, and we're not yet, again, come back to that, the way to run these machines is, is you know, absolute lights out, uh, high volume, around the clock. Uh, and we've got some actually, I got a few things up my sleeve that we're gonna be changing up to, to be able to do that. This machine as it sits right here is not suited for that because it doesn't have fire suppression. Okay, so we got rid of the tool. It's gonna come down here. Spindle's gonna come over and kiss the bar. And then it's gonna, the bar feeder's gonna push and the spindle's gonna help control the exact amount out that it comes. And we're done. So let's talk about programming and offsets. G54 is the face of our collet, so that doesn't change. So we know in Fusion we've got whatever that would be, inch and a half stick out here. And so we program pretty much like you would any lathe uh, from this point on. Quite simple, Fusion makes it easy with turning tools, milling tools, tool orientation. Uh, obviously it's a five axis machine and that really opens up a lot of windows because you can take a traditional end mill, 3 16th end mill, quarter inch end mill, and you can use that tool uh, axially, radially to chamfer, to do five axis contouring. If it's bull nose, you can do uh, deburring with it. And one of the key parts that we make on this machine is a part that would be pretty tricky to make uh, on another style machine because it's got some five axis work on the end and it's got that angled tip right there, which is also deburred using the Fusion deburr tool path. This is uh, part for our relatively new puck chuck zero point uh, automated clamping system. So G54 is simple to call face. Then there's G55, and that is the position when the vise pivots up, grabs the part, and pulls it out a programmed amount of distance. And you would you might want to do that to gain more access to the part, or have uh, you, be able to part off or end mill up part off um, before you then go to the next offset. We don't always use G55, but it is there. When it then breaks the part off and moves it down, rotating it from here down to here, and the vise, that's G56. So again, that's what I love about this machine. It's really simple uh, with the help of Rob Lockwood's container method and CJ's work on his Willemans. We've got a really efficient fusion workflow with the tool library, with the, uh, the kinematics of the machine, the setup to where, again, we can program complicated parts really easily, which I absolutely love. It has a bloom laser to check tool length as well as tool break. And there's a whisker here. Uh, you can't really see it, but can do a part check to make sure the part came off. The newer machines have a feature that I really like, which is also a tool break whisker, a wire in the tool carousel. That way you can do break detect on every single tool without costing you any cycle time. Sorry, show off the tool changer real quick. Uh, because again, this machine is, is all about process reliability and look, you don't want to, you know, try to thread mill a hole that never got drilled. That sort of thing can catch, catch it.
So a few things that are drawbacks or lessons learned on this machine. Number one, everything is really expensive. The holders um, are very cool, but they are very expensive. It's easy to spend, uh, well, 300 would be almost the bottom end. Some of the turning holders that are that we use are small are eight or nine hundred dollars. So uh, very expensive. A lot of folks go with the Rego Fix. We have not yet. Uh, we have a number of the Technics holders, and then uh, Mari Tool actually just started coming out with this holder size as well, which is awesome. Um, it has a very limited gauge length on this machine. Probably one of the bigger overall drawbacks or limitations period is your overall gauge length is limited uh, i'll have to ask or put it in the comments below uh, i believe it's three and a half inches but basically you can't use long drills some tools we've had to chop down uh, it's definitely been a learning curve to that this particular machine because of its age is limited to a 25 millimeter through bore so that's just under one inch, uh, that is a big limitation. The new version of the 408MT is 36 millimeters. That's just over one and three eighths. And there's a big difference in that diameter for a lot of the parts that I wish I could run on this machine, uh, as well as the fact that the new machines are obviously not 20 years old, higher RPMs, some better features around process reliability and so forth. Uh, the one other drawback, and this is true, uh, or rather not specific to Willemans, I believe, but more specific to uh, a lot of the ways any bar feeder works on machines like this, is that some of the larger diameter bars uh, have to be bar prep. In other words, if we had a new Willemans and we were running the max size 36 millimeter or one and three eighths, you cannot just buy a bar of material we have a six foot, whether it's a six or 12 foot, you can't just buy a bar and drop it in the bar feeder. You actually have to turn down the nub end of the material. Uh, there might be a trade off to where you could not do that and you end up with a significantly longer remnant. So don't quote me on that, but that's kind of one of the, I wish I had known bucket of information where, uh, man, that's uh, crazy to think that you either have to put the material on a separate CNC machine, perhaps try to order it that way. I'm unaware if any vendors really provide that. Or what CJ did was bought a product called a uh, Bar Champ or a Bar King. We'll put a link in the description, which is a small machine, which is really cool. The material doesn't turn. Uh, the cutting tool turns as a lathe. That way you don't have to support a long stick of material like you traditionally do in a bar feeder to prevent bar whip, um, but not an inexpensive machine. Uh, worth it when you're doing production, but again, kind of add back to the whole theme of building an ecosystem around uh, a machine like this to get it running. The IAMCA bar machine feeder is really cool. It's a super high-end bar feeder, and it has a, I believe, a hydrostatic sort of layer of oil in there. So when the bar's turning, it's kind of floating in there. But um, it's been kind of one of those, it just works, and it just works great. And uh, that's awesome. Here's another view of the tool changer. The new machines also, uh, they believe they import all of them into the U.S. with 72 tools. So uh, when I first started building out a fusion test uh, programs for the parts that we would want to make if we could get one of these machines, I, I, I capped out at like 17 tools. Be because of the five axis nature, and you can do so much with, like I said, a single end mill, a few turning tools, so forth. Uh, it was pretty incredible how versatile it was, again, compared to your traditional driven tool turret. And finally, the last point is we treat this thing as well as we can. In other words, we're really uh, ginger with it. We're not drilling big holes. We're not capping big holes. It is not a brute uh, muscle car. It is a nimble machine. So we're careful with how we put torque on the spindle. Uh, when you turn, we're careful with how much cut we take. Uh, that, that frankly has led to some difficulties around chip control. I did kind of clean out the machine a little bit before we filmed. So in full disclosure, there were some bird's nests built up around it and we've had to uh, continuously kind of clean those out. Uh, but it is something where uh, partly I think it's just the overall build and style of the machine. Partly it's because this machine is 20 years old and I don't want to say uh, tax the spindle because we're trying to take, like I said, a heavy cut, uh, heavy capping cut or, uh, or a heavy OD turning cut. We do a lot of thread milling and single point turning as well. It's just great though. Uh, like I said, we use it for a lot of our products now. Some of this is new Puck Chuck products. This is a new idea for a Gen 3 Mod Vice washer, which we actually can't fit on this machine. So that's kind of one of the things I'm chewing on where we run these right now on our SC20Y. And again, they run great. 
But that's kind of, I guess, all, how I'll wrap this video up is the thesis for us behind a machine like this is we've got one machine. So yes, it's you could argue it's bad that you're relying on everything with one machine or, or rather a drawback, but it's so capable and we're able to quickly switch out the soft jaws, which are relatively inexpensive. And we've done 3D printed ones, aluminum ones, steel ones, hardened steel ones. But to be able to create a product line of products that we sell, where when we need to make 100 or 1,000, it's a very simple and fast changeover. We're not having to swap out tools. There's not that risk around it. That, to me, is what modern manufacturing is all about. And that's why I love this format of a machine. One last thing that's worth adding, it's a huge valuable point to this machine. It's tiny. Uh, it is relatively lightweight. You know, we could unload it. I think it weighs 4,000 pounds. Made it easy to unload. You could move it around. Not that that's a huge value or attribute to us, but it is incredibly wonderfully small footprint. Obviously the bar feeder adds a little bit to it, but uh, that matters. I, I really see more and more reason behind that and care more about that. I'll walk you behind it real quick. Um, but the size is great. That's a hydraulic unit and a spindle chiller. And then we have our, uh, again, our blow off box right above it. So as always folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. If you run a Willamette or have had experience one, I actually would love to hear about it. They're the coolest, just they really are the coolest machines. Otherwise folks, take care. See you soon.